prayer is uh, at this point in my life, I would like to say humbly and respectfully, prayer at this point in my life is not something I do. It is a friend. It's not something, it's a friend. Prayer is, has ceased to be a duty for me. It has ceased to be a, um, an obligation. Prayer is my friend. Many of life's burdens have been made easier because of prayer. Many of life's joys have been made sweeter because of prayer. Many concerns have been wiped away because of prayer. Many worries have been taken off my heart's burden because of prayer. I didn't know when my sisters had me kneel by my bedside when I was five years old to teach me to talk to God in that very simple way. Now I lay me down to sleep. I didn't realize that my sisters were giving me a great gift. I'm not sure they realized that they were giving me a great gift. But to teach someone to turn to God in the hour of need and to seek Him in prayer is the greatest of all gifts. Many times when I've been to a hospital in someone's dire moment, uh, I will say, let's pray. And the tears will just freely flow down the cheeks of even hardened people who do not claim the name of Christ. But when we pray, they sense the presence of God and that tough exterior is softened, even if just for a little while. Because they sense their need of God and they sense the presence of God. Prayer is a great power. It is a great gift in this world. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything, everything to God in prayer. I hope that all of us can leave here with a renewed sense of of the privilege of prayer and that we will begin to take steps. <clears throat> I wanted to encourage you a little bit in this before we talk about intercessory prayer. Prayer is hard work. In a setting like this, it's much, it's much easier. Well, for some, it's much easier. For others, it is harder in a setting like this because um, for some people, to be with people and to pray with people makes prayer harder because they find prayer to be a very personal, very private thing, and to, to be with other people and to express deep personal things is extremely hard for those individuals. Doesn't mean they're not spiritual. Doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with them. God created them to be the way they are. Prayer ministry is not a cookie cutter thing. Uh, not everybody approaches God the same way. Not everybody relates to God the same way. And not everybody relates to each other the same way. So one of the greatest things that you can do for your brothers and sisters when you go back home is to not expect them to be just like you. And to not expect them to pray exactly the way you pray. Let God work with those people as he sees best to do. But prayer, every, every author I've ever read on the subject of prayer, every single one, whether it's Andrew Murray or A.W. Tozer or Ellen White or whoever it might be, sooner or later they all say the same thing, prayer is hard work. Because it's a spiritual thing. We do not naturally seek God. It's not in our human nature to seek God. Romans chapter 3, verse 11, in case you want a verse to go with that. It's, it's something that... God calls us. We feel the call to prayer. And we respond to prayer but, and to that call. But we find that many times our, our minds wander when we pray or we get sleepy when we pray or we don't know what to say when we pray. The Bible speaks of this 
condition that every great man and woman of God in the Bible all experienced. So if you experience any of those things when you try to pray, then you're a normal Christian. So don't be discouraged because prayer is a skill that we learn to acquire. It's not something that just comes natural. Now, like any skill, some people find it easier than other people do, but everyone has a learning curve when it comes to prayer. So don't be discouraged. Stay with it and keep at it and think it will get better. I don't know if any of you have ever been engaged in any kind of athletics or any kind of, of like learning to, to be a runner, but when you, when you start to be a runner, you, your body hurts when you run at first, even when you're young. And your breathing is not quite in sync. You feel this sort of disjointed dissonance going on when you're trying to run. But after you get out there and you've gone the first quarter mile, the first half mile, your body starts to warm up, your joints feel better, your, your breathing is more in sync, and, then, and, the, and the stronger you get and the more endurance you develop in learning to run, after a while when you get in that zone and at, at the right pace for you, you can just keep going and going and going. I went out one day when I was in my running years and I was doing a lot of running, now I do a lot of bicycling. But when I was doing a lot of running, I, I remember when I was out there, I would I say, like I'd say to my wife on a Sunday, she'd say, so how far do you think you want to go today? I said, today I'm going to try 10 miles. And so I'd never done 10 miles before. But I got out, and just like every other day, I get out there, and my body wasn't in sync yet. My breathing wasn't in rhythm yet. My joints were a little stiff. But after a while, I loosened up, warmed up, and I kept going, and at that pace, I just kept going and going and going. And when I finished 10 miles, I felt like I could keep going. Prayer is like that. When you kneel down to pray, expect to have resistance from the devil and from your nature, from your human nature. And your mind will not be in sync yet, and you won't be in rhythm yet when you kneel to pray. But give it, don't, don't just jump up and say, I, I, I'm going to fail. Don't do that. Stay with it. Stay with it and keep at it. And I have found that it really helps to read through the Bible as you pray. Open your Bible and go to some place like Psalms or Proverbs or some pat, part of Scripture, maybe John or something, and just start reading through that as you pray. And, and the Bible will actually help you to know what to say to God. And as you're praying through the scriptures, the scriptures will just open up to you and you're going to end up having this amazing conversation with God as you're going through this prayer experience using your Bible. It's a really powerful thing to do. It's one of my favorite things to do. And sometimes as I'm reading through some story in the life of Jesus at, on my knees as I'm praying through that story, it just opens up to me and many times the tears will go down my cheeks or I will be inspired by something I see in his life that I didn't see before but as you're as you're there in that prayer experience with God like that he speaks to you and you will hear his voice and this it takes time I'm, I'm condensing years of of prayer in a small bit of time here so don't be discouraged if you find that some of these things come hard at first because that's the way it is for everybody. Think of it like learning to drive a car or learning to fly a plane or learning to drive a tractor or learning to sew on a sewing machine. It takes time. And as, as you put forth the effort and you keep at it, you get better at it. It's just like learning to cook or learning to do any other skill. You, you, you get ideas from other people. You, you try that. Maybe that worked for you, but maybe that other thing didn't. And you, you keep trying. And you stay with it. But above all things, don't be discouraged. Keep on praying to God. Can we say amen to that? Amen. Don't be discouraged. So when you go back home and, and you, try to put, you try to be more active in prayer, you're going you're gonna to experience some difficulty in the prayer experience itself. But just hang in there and stay with it and keep trying. It does get better. And remember, if your mind starts to wander 
or you get sleepy, you may have to stand up, get a drink of water, you may have to get a breath of fresh air or whatever, but then you come right back to it and you, and you keep doing it. And then, you know, and then after a while, just, just quit. You know, after you've struggled like that for a while, you know, maybe, maybe you've been saturated and don't beat yourself up. Just, just say, okay, tomorrow's another day and I'm going to come back at it again tomorrow. Okay, can we, can we have that agreement that you're going to stay with it, you know, and just keep trying and just keep trying. And, and don't be hard on yourself. And don't think that there's something wrong with you if you find that it's hard to do. And you may, you may get busy on a certain day, and you may forget to spend that time with the Lord that day, and then you'll feel bad. But God still loves you, Amen. and he's not going to condemn you. And then and just say, well, tomorrow's another day. Or, but pray through the day. I pray all through the day. You probably do too. There's a lot of things to pray about. But don't neglect secret prayer. For secret prayer is the soul of religion in your life. Secret prayer is the power to live for Christ in this life. That's where it's at, is spending that time in secret prayer. So don't neglect that. Stay with it. You're, gonna, you're probably going to forget something's going to the phone the devil's going to be after you the phone's going to ring or the kids are going to do this or your husband or wife is going to say that or you, life on planet earth right but you come back at it again the next day you don't quit just because yesterday didn't go so well right you stay with it Amen. isn't that right mark you agree with that too jim you you stay with it you don't you don't quit and as you do that you'll find that your experience with the Lord will get better and better as time goes by. I just wanted to make sure I said a few of those things so that you could go home practically prepared for real life as you try to fight against the devil back home, right? Because it is a fight, isn't it? And, and you're, you're going to have a conflict with him. So a few things. Some of this I talked about last night. I'm going to go through some of these things quickly. But first of all, this is our church. Kirkland Seventh-day Adventist Church, that's one of our elders up there on a Sabbath morning, and uh, a lot of people there uh, to worship God on that particular Sabbath, and uh, I think it's a beautiful church. I, I enjoy being there on Sabbath with the people, praising God, and uh, we have a lot of prayer warriors there uh, that are just beautiful people like you. They're just like you. They're beautiful people. They love God, and they come together for prayer. And I'm very grateful. I'm very encouraged by the folk there from our Kirkland Church. If you ever get to the Seattle area, there, there are other churches in the area, but you should come to our church, okay? <laughs> so. This is Kirkland. And you can see in the distance, those buildings is Bellevue. That's not Seattle. That's Bellevue. Bellevue is east of Seattle. Uh, and this is the view from Kirkland looking toward Bellevue, and the, the whole area has a lot of lakes and uh, a lot of trees, and in the other direction, when you turn and look the other direction from Kirkland, if I can make it work somehow, I did something wrong, I guess, there we go, well, back up, there, and now that you look the other direction from Kirkland, and there's Seattle and Mount Rainier, off in the distance, so, so when I... Right, what you're looking at there is about three to four million people in that area right there. Most of them don't know Jesus. And they don't, uh, they don't come to church. And they don't read the brochures we send them. And they don't listen to the radio broadcasts or the TV broadcasts. That bothers me a lot. So I pray for them, and that's why we pray. That's why we pray. I pray for them. Atlanta. How many people in Atlanta? How many? Five million? How many of them know Jesus? Or maybe Calhoun or Memphis. Some of you are from Memphis or from Nashville or... Millions of people, Chattanooga, millions of people. We've, we have a lot of work to do. 
We have a lot of work to do. We have to pray. I've been praying, praying, Lord, how? How, how do I get the attention of these people? How do we get their attention long enough to be able to say anything to them? How do we do that? I need God's help. Don't you need God's help? Yeah. Need God's help. Let's, in fact, uh, Mark, would you come up and, and lead us in a prayer? You know the cities here. I don't know the cities. Would you come up and lead us in a prayer for Atlanta and other cities in this conference uh, and ask God to, to help us know what to do? Okay. Let's stand together. And why don't you just take maybe, let's just hold hands here across the aisles. You know, we represent different cities, different towns, different communities. And, and some are obviously not represented here. But Our Father God, the creator of this universe, the king that sits upon the throne, what a privilege it is for us to just pause here a moment and to acknowledge you for who you are. And God, what a privilege it is to know you. What a privilege it is to call upon you. And dear God, as we think upon our mission, our task, that you've given to this fledgling church. Father, we pause here a moment to ask you to please pour out your spirit upon our people, upon our cities, upon our communities. God, to break down the strongholds of the enemy, to neutralize uh, his influence where he's keeping people back from the chances that you send across their pathway to learn the words of eternal life, to come into a saving knowledge of you as Redeemer and friend and your word. We pray for the outpouring of your spirit across our conference, across this great division of ours. Yes, Lord, the cities, the towns, the rural communities, the coastal cities, the inner land cities, the heartland. Father, across this great, great continent. And yes, Lord, we pray for the outpouring of your spirit in the form of the latter rain right around the world. And your people everywhere. And God, give us the eyes of faith. To know that what is impossible with man is so possible with you. Amen. Thank you for the privilege of knowing that. And we go forward in doing your work in that spirit and with that assurance and promise. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I know and believe that as I have prayed for Seattle and you have just prayed for your city the Holy Spirit, and many angels Amen. this moment have been sent to the people who live in those places. How does he touch all those lives at the same time? I don't understand the mechanics of how he does things. All I know is that he does. Amen. And as he touches those people right this moment, their hearts have been turned to God today. It's Sunday, and most people are thinking about God today. It's the wrong day. We know that. But it's a good day. And for a lot of people, they're thinking about church and they're thinking about God and they don't think about that every other day of the week. But when Sunday comes around, they do. So I thank God for Sunday, even though I know it's going to be a problem in the future. I thank God for Sunday because today people are thinking about Jesus. So I'm grateful for that. So I believe these things. I believe in prayer. I believe in intercessory prayer, which is praying for other people. I'd like Jim and uh, Mark to come back up here. I want to illustrate something for you. So come on up here, guys. So when you pray for someone, here's, here's what actually happens when you pray for someone. So let's say that Jim is someone that I'm praying for 
that I'm concerned about. And let's say that Mark represents a force that is trying to uh, get to Jim and take him away from God. All right, so, so here's Jim. All right, so when, when he's, here, he's here and I feel that he's in danger and this force which Mark represents is trying to get to him. So when, so when you pray, what literally happens is that you are allowing Jesus to do this. Yeah, that's what happens. And, and, and as long as you keep praying, Jesus' presence keeps coming between the one that you're praying for and the evil that's trying to get to him. Amen. Most of us quit praying too soon. And so then the, the, the presence that we don't want has more access because we quit praying. So pray, pray, pray. I, one thing I'm really, you know, you have a lot of people talk about quality of prayer versus quantity of prayer. I, I, I'm a believer in quantity of prayer too. And I like quality prayer, but I, I believe in quantity of prayer. The more prayer that we, that we send to God, the more buffer there is between our loved one and some evil that we want to try to keep from getting to our loved one. Okay, thanks guys. Appreciate that. So, so Jesus is our intercessor, remember? He's our intercessor. And what does that mean? He's our mediator. That literally means he's the one who stands between. The one who comes between you and evil. He is the mediator. He's the intercessor. He is there on our behalf, uh, shielding us from the evil that would otherwise come to us. That's why we study in the Bible and talk about the withdrawing of the Holy Spirit from the earth and how evil comes on the earth because of the Spirit's presence being withdrawn. As long as Jesus is there pleading on, on behalf of humanity, the influence of evil is mitigated. You, you follow that? And the more that you pray, the more of the presence of Jesus comes to the lives of the people you're concerned about and the less evil has access to them. And we'll see that again in a little bit. 1 Timothy chapter 2, a well-known verse on prayer, verses 1 to 4. Peter, uh, Paul there in verse 1 says, I urge you first of all, and that's an ordinal number in Greek, and that means most importantly. The most important thing you can do as a Christian is to pray. Now, I know we have these little cultural sayings that we use when we've gone to the doctor or we've tried this or that, and we go, well, all we can do now is pray. You know, but when you, when you say that even, it almost makes it sound like, well, prayer is our last resort, you know? I mean, and it's like, it's too bad that all we can do now is pray. But biblically, the Bible says the most important thing that you can do in any situation is to pray. And when you pray, amazing things happen. So uh, there was an atheist in this church where, uh, where I lived at the time in, in this town. His wife had been baptized. She had also been an atheist, and she had been baptized. And now she was coming to church, and I was fairly new to that district. I didn't know her very well. But she came up to me at church one Sabbath, and she said, Pastor, would you play, pray for my husband, Ron? I said, yes, well, how may I pray? She said, he's an atheist. He doesn't believe in God. I would like you to pray that he comes to the Lord and experiences the presence of God in, in his life like I have experienced in my life. And I said, oh, I'll be happy to do that. So I began to pray for Ron. Other people in the church were praying for Ron. That's his real name, by the way. And uh, then uh, on Wednesday night, she, she started coming to prayer meeting. And so Every Wednesday night, we would get together, and we would pray for Ron. And the, the prayers were so earnest. I know God was hearing those prayers. It was 1995. Anybody remember 1995? And we had a program that originated out of Tennessee, Nashville, right? I think it was Nashville, wasn't it? At Net 95? Was it Chattanooga? Okay, it came out of Chattanooga. And Mark Finley was a speaker. Remember that? And I, and I have to say this because I still find this amusing. One of the things when I joined the church that I found uh, people talked a lot about how we shouldn't watch TV. Do you remember that? Back in those days especially, people would say, oh, there's too much, too much TV. We shouldn't watch TV, you know? So then Net95 comes along, and now they want everybody to watch TV, you know? <laughs> I mean, I just kind of thought that was kind of ironic, you know? And so now they're telling every church to buy a satellite dish and get a big screen or, some, or a projector, and, and the church is spending all this money to get all this stuff, and and I'm thinking as a pastor at the point, at that point, I'm thinking, 
are people really going to leave their home and come to my church and watch TV in my, in my church, you know? But they did, didn't they? They did that. It was amazing. So Net95, she heard about this, and she was so excited. She was so excited. She came to prayer meeting after she heard about this program. She said, oh, I'm so excited that we're going to have Net95. She said, my husband is a TV addict. He's a TV addict. He was semi-retired. And he had this, in the, he had a big TV. I went to their home to visit, so I saw it myself. Gigantic big TV back in 1995 in a big cabinet. Remember that? Any of you ever remember seeing those? Really big thing. And uh, out in his yard, he had this, the latest satellite dish, but it was gigantic, you know. It was huge. And then he had his stereo hooked up to his TV. He had a home theater before anybody ever coined that phrase, Okay. <laughs> He, he was really into his TV, and his wife said he's an addict. He watches TV all the time when he's home. And uh, so she said, I, I believe God is sending this program for people like my husband. She said, so please pray for Ron that he will watch Net95. So we started praying that Ron would watch Net95. So as the time approached on that Wednesday night before the Friday night when the program began, she said to us, now tomorrow I'm going to talk to my husband and I'm going to ask him to watch on Friday night the, the program with me. She said, please pray that God will give me the right words and that he will be willing to sit down and watch it with me. So man, we prayed that night. We were excited with her and we were hoping and hoping that he would watch, you know. So we prayed that God would give her the words to talk to her husband. So the next day, she sees Ron, and they told us later how this all went. So she, she comes to Ron, and she says, Ron, she said, uh, have I ever complained about your TV watching? And he said, no, you've never complained about it. She said, have I ever asked you to watch something that I want to watch? She, he said, well, uh, now that I think about it, I don't think you ever have. Where are you going with this? He said. <laughs> and then she said, well, Friday night there's a program I would like to watch, and I, I'm hoping that you'll watch it with me. And he said, well, what's that? And she said, well, my church is putting on a program that's called Net95, and it's going to be really good, and I really want you to sit down with me and watch that. Well, he said to her, he said, you know I don't believe in that stuff. He said, you know I don't have, want to have anything at all. Why would you ask me to do something you know I really don't want to do? She said, it's really important to me. And she said, I wish you would sit and just watch this one time with me. You know, he said, he, he kept kind of resisting. He said, I, I, you know, I really don't believe in that. And then, then she put on all her feminine charms, ladies. <laughs> and she, she batted those Bambi eyes. And, and she looked at him so, so enticingly. And she said, just this once, just for me, Ron, please. Man, what guy can resist that? I mean, you know? And so he, so he said, okay, one time. So she was delighted. So Friday night, Net95 is ready to start. He goes over to the satellite receiver. He he turn, you know, he, he tunes in the right satellite, and then he changes to the right channel, and boom, there comes Net95 up. And he sits down on the couch, and he watches the whole thing all the way through the end. And uh, after it's over, of course, she turns to Ron, and she says, so how did you like it? And he said, well, he said, actually, I was surprised that it was as good a quality as it is. <laughs> he said, but, he said, I really don't believe any of that stuff, and I really don't want to have anything to do with it. So he gets up. She's a little disappointed. He gets up. He walks over to the satellite receiver to tune in a different satellite, and it won't work. <laughs> and then he tries to change the channel, and it won't work. <laughs> and now he's frustrated. He gets out his troubleshooting manual, and he goes, well, what's wrong? You know, and he starts reading through, try this, try this, do this, do that. And, you know, and, and he knows that he shouldn't go out and manually try to move his satellite because he'll mess it all up. So he doesn't do that. So he's frustrated. But he's a TV what? So the only thing he could watch all weekend. 
was net 95. And he watched that whole thing, all right? So then on Monday, though, Monday morning, he gets on the phone, and he calls up the satellite repairman. Now, this is 1995. Satellite technology is still pretty new, and a lot of people are starting to buy satellite dishes and all this stuff. So there's one satellite repairman for that entire county. So he calls up the satellite repairman, and he says, I've got this problem. I've been through the troubleshooting process. It's still not fixed. I need you to come and fix it for me. When can you come? He says, well, I'll come and help you. He said, but all I can do is put you at the bottom of the list. And he said, well, how long will that be? He said, I can't get there for at least three weeks. <laughs> and Ron is a... So the only thing he can watch for three weeks is... Ned 95. <laughs> and at the end of that three, four week period of time, by that time he had accepted Christ as his Savior, started keeping the Sabbath, and, started, and changed his diet and, and got rid of unclean meats, and he was starting to, to follow the, the Lord, and I baptized him. <laughs> now, when I, when I was there in the in the little room that's adjacent to the baptistry, we were talking about the process that led him to that point. And he turned to me, he said, Pastor, he said, do you think God sets people up? <laughs> and I said, Ron, I have no question that he does. <laughs> so ever after that, when Ron would tell his testimony, he would start by saying, let me tell you how God set me up. Now, the next day, after he was baptized, he gets up on Sunday, and he says to himself, I wonder. So he walks over to the satellite, and it works perfectly. <laughs> no problem at all. Change the satellite, change the channel. And so he, he knew right then for sure that God had worked a miracle to save his soul. And you and I can both agree that we need a lot more miracles like that, don't we? But that, that miracle came into Ron's life because of the faith of praying people who would not let him go. And they prayed and prayed and prayed. And God heard their prayers and worked on his behalf. Now, he could have resisted. He could have just said, that's it. He could have gone on a vacation. He could have done anything. But there was a little part of him that responded to the Holy Spirit. And God took that little part. God will get, will, he'll take any little thing that people will give him and he'll, he'll use that and expand that and bring his, his wonderful truth and his salvation into that person's life. We just really need to do battle against the enemy in prayer. It, I, I'm just more and more convicted of that, that if my people pray, humble themselves, confess their sins, that God will hear from heaven and he will heal and do miracles. If we will just really believe and get together and put forth the effort that it takes. Now, we talked about healing a little bit yesterday. Uh, in fact, quite a little bit. And remember, God's plan A is to what? To heal. God's plan B is to save. If, if he, He'll heal you, absolutely. And those of you who came this morning and prayed for healing, don't you doubt it. God set up a process this morning. He's going to lead you toward better health. But if he sees that by giving you better health, that it's going to somehow separate you from God, then he's going to go to plan B. And we'll be okay with that, right? Because ultimately, we want to be in heaven. Now, I have a couple of little, just so you know that I don't say this lightly, I have a couple of chronic little things I battle with on a daily basis. But that's okay. God hasn't seen fit to completely remove those things from my life. But I, I, I'm okay with that. Because if that's what it takes for me to stay close to him and pray, and I pray a lot more because of those things, and if that's the case, well, all right, then heaven is cheap enough, right? So we want to, to come. But I have seen, I just want to share a few more things. A mother uh, called me up. She says, I've got cancer in, my, uh, in her female organs. And she said, uh, I, would you come and pray? And so I met with the husband and we went to her room there, and we prayed for her. We anointed her with oil and committed her to God, if it's God's will, if it can bring glory to his name, and if it was for her best good, and we, we trusted that God would do the right thing. It's a, it's, a, uh, it's a terrifying thing, especially for some people, to realize that they've got cancer or something like that. And, 
and to, to, to have to face that. And she was only about 35 at the time, maybe, maybe a little bit older. And so with two precious little kids to take care of, you know, that, that can be very terrifying to people. And so, you know, there she is, tears coming down her cheeks and her husband's tear, teary-eyed, and we're just pleading with God to, to work in her behalf. But she was a committed Christian, and she just peacefully yielded her life to God and said, you know, Lord, your will be done. And then, then they, they took her on into surgery, and uh, it wasn't that we were expected, you know, expecting we were going to be in the waiting room, you know, an hour, two hours, whatever it was going to take for that whole process to happen. About 30, 40 minutes later, the doctor comes back out and he says, he says, you know, we went in, we took her in and we opened her up and we were going to perform the surgery to remove the cancer. He said, but there was no need to. He said, the, uh, the tumors are gone. And he said, he said, in fact, I've never seen anything like this before. He said, uh, he said, there were little places where we could see that the tumors had been. So we knew the tumors were there, which confirmed what the test showed, but the tumors themselves were gone. And he says, I don't know how to explain that. And uh, her husband, name is Joe, by, by the way, uh, just talked to him yesterday, as a matter of fact. He said uh, to the doctor, he says, well, doctor, he says, I don't know what you believe about God, but we came to God in prayer, and we asked God to heal my wife, and we believe that God heard our prayer, and I believe that what you have experienced is a miracle. And the doctor said, well, that's the only explanation that makes any sense. To his credit, he didn't dismiss it. He didn't try to make light of it. He just said, well, that's the only thing that makes sense. And so God, in that case, saw fit. But now let me tell you a couple of other miracle stories that didn't turn out the way I thought and the way I wanted, because you experienced this too. So I was at camp meeting, and I got a message from the messenger uh, at where I was working for camp meeting. He said, you must call, uh, and it was a particular person uh, who was involved in the Samoan community. I've always, I don't know, you know, God leads everybody differently, but I've always had a, a church that had a, another language, whatever it was, or a people group. In, one case, in two cases, it was a Hispanic church that I pastored, uh, and my little bit of Spanish trying to, you know, get by, you know. Another time it was a Russian congregation. Another time it was a Samoan congregation. And I've, I've had these people groups that I've been a part of all these years, and I've always enjoyed it because the potlucks are awesome, you know. And so, but... You know, but uh, so so I, in this case, it was the Samoan group that I had. There was about 30 or 40 Samoans, and I was trying to pastor them along with the English church. So we every Tuesday night, we would play volleyball. And, and at least that group of Samoans, they're great volleyball players, man. And uh, we were having a wonderful time. And the leader of that group was Lee. His name was Lee. And 23 years old, about five years younger than me at the time, and we were good friends. We were really good friends. We just had, he was a great guy. I enjoyed being around him, and we would pray together and plan things together, work together. Terrific guy. And so um, when I called and asked what was the problem, they said, Lee is in the hospital. He has taken suddenly very ill, and the doctors are concerned for his life. You must come and pray for him immediately. So I'm on my way to the hospital. On the way to the hospital, I'm praying, but I'm thinking, this is good. Because I know that there's going to be a lot of Samoan people there who don't believe yet. They haven't given their life to the Lord. And the Lord's going to heal Lee. And this is going to be a, a testimony. And these people are going to turn to God because of the healing in Lee. I had it all planned out. I had it all figured out, you know. And so I'm going in there. And I go into that room. And the Samoan people as a group, they, they are very... Um, uh, very close-knit group, all of them, and they sort of see all everybody in the Samoan community as family, and they do everything together, and they have a lot of stuff like that. And so in this, uh, in this little group in the hospital there, there was about 13 or 15 other Samoan people that were all crowded into that little intensive care unit surrounding Lee's bedside, which I had kind of expected knowing how they had been. So I go to, the, to Lee's bedside, and he's very ill, and I begin to pray for him, and everybody's gathered around, and I'm praying. And I loved Lee. And, uh, and, you know, you being here this weekend, you know, sometimes the tears come to my eyes. And, and as I was praying for him, I could not help but feel a little emotional. And I'm just really 
praying for God to work a miracle. But not only was I praying because I, I loved Leah as my friend, but I was also praying because I, I love the Lord and I want his reputation to be awesome. And I want people to love him and serve him and give their life to him and be saved by him. I want him to be victorious. And so I was feeling all of this in my heart. And so the tears were just flowing down my cheeks as I'm praying for this. I anointed him with oil. I prayed like I've prayed for others. God's will be done for the, for the good of Lee and that glory could come to God's name. But Lee didn't get well. And he passed away just an hour later. Sudden, sudden illness hit him and just took him just so fast. And I felt like a failure. I felt like I had let God down. I, maybe I shouldn't have. I probably shouldn't have, but I felt that way. I did. I felt that way. And I started looking into my life. I thought, I can't think of anything that would keep you from, from blessing. Why did you let him die? And, and, you know, for several days, it just I, that hung over me. And I just was just having quite a, a tug of war with the Lord in prayer and it, it really hit me hard, and I was just, why, Lord, why? It doesn't make any sense. I couldn't figure it out, and I, I, I couldn't under. And I thought, well, you know, the Samoan community, they're not going to have confidence in me anymore. You know, why, why would they want to talk to me? I, you know, they called upon me in the hour of their extremity, and, and I couldn't deliver. You know, that's how I looked at it. That, you know, it, it's human thoughts and human thinking. You know, at, at that time, I wasn't really maybe even thinking as clearly as I should have, but that's, that's what was happening. And so I'm struggling with all of this, and I was so shocked. I was just so shocked when the king, because in the Samoan community, they, they have a sort of monarchy kind of thing going on there, and, and different tribes of the Samoans have kings. And so this particular group, they had a king, and he called me up and and he said, uh, we're having the service for Lee on this day. And he said, we want you to be the speaker at the, at the service. And so with the Samoan community, they have like a wake when it went for several days. But it kind of in the middle of that process is when they would have the main service. And so he was asking me if I would come and speak for that main part of the service. And I couldn't believe it. I was shocked. I, I said, you want me to come and do that? I couldn't. I, I didn't think they'd want to have anything to do with me anymore. And he said, yeah, we don't want anybody else. We want you. You come. We want you to come do it. Will you do it? I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. It's, I said, I would think of it as an honor to do that. But I said, you're sure you want me? Yes, we want you. And so I said, okay, you know. So I'm praying about this and, and really giving it a lot of thought. And I knew that a lot, I mean, I knew there'd be hundreds of Samoans at that service. And many of them were not Christian. And this, this was something that I was really pondering and carrying heavy on my heart. And so I show up at the funeral home on the appointed day. And when I went there, the king meets me at the door. And uh, Jim, this is what he, he said to me when I met him at the door. He said, now, pastor, please don't be offended. We understand. We all know, of course, that you're a white guy. And he said, he said, now, you, you need to understand that we don't want a white man's sermon today. Now, he's telling, he's telling me this at the door, you know, 30 minutes before the service, okay? And he's saying, we know that it's customary at, at a funeral for American people to do like a 10-minute or 15-minute sermon. He said, but if you do that, you will offend us. He said, you must speak for at least an hour and a half. <laughs> and he said, it would be better if it was two hours. Now, I promise you, I have never had anybody ever say that to me since. <laughs> but he said, you must, you must speak for at least an hour and a half. And so, man, my mind is getting into high speed right away. And I'm thinking, okay, I came with this much, and now it's got to be like this much, you know. And I start praying about it. So... I finally, I've started writing stuff down on a piece of paper and, you know, all kinds of things. And I preached about the gospel, the second coming, the state of the dead, <laughs> hell, the millennium, heaven. I brought all that in. And I, I, was finally, I was finally able to stretch all that out to an hour and a half, you know. And uh, I, I was exhausted when I was done. 
and I'm all, and, and he was happy. He was happy with that. They were happy with that. And so we had a big meal afterwards, and I'm sitting there at the table. Now, see, I had it all figured out. God's going to go in there, and he's going to heal Lee, and everybody's going to go, wow, you know, and they're going to be amazed at what God did, and, and they're going to love God, and they're going to serve God, and they're going to give their life to Jesus because of this miracle. I had it all figured out. But he has, God's ways are mysterious. His wonders to perform. So I, I'm there eating, and four different people who had been in the room that night when I prayed for Lee, all four of whom were not Christian, every one of them at different times during the meal came up to me, and like one guy, the first guy, he came up, he put his hand on my shoulder, I was sitting down, he knelt down, put his hand on my shoulder, whispered in my ear, said, Pastor, I was there the night you came to pray for Lee. And he said, I just want you to know that I've decided to give my life to Jesus. He said, when you prayed for Lee and I saw how much you loved him, I said, if a white man can love my brother like that, then maybe Jesus can love me too. Amen. And in different ways, they all said something to me like that. And then on the way home, I cried for a different reason because of my stupidity and because, and because of my lack of faith and because God had taken my two barley loaves and half a fish and made a banquet for those people. God is amazing. He's amazing how he works. And, and when we pray, we need to have faith that God will answer and do it the way that he thinks is best. Can we agree with that? Amen. That we need to trust God. Well, I just want to quickly, time is way, well past where we should be, but some scientific studies show that God does heal people. And these were three separate studies done at three different times in the past, three different areas where they were able to scientifically show that even people who didn't know they were being prayed for experienced dramatic improvement in health as a result of prayer. Uh, some other quotes, again, I, a lot of this stuff we talked about, if God says no to healing, that's because of plan B, which these verses represent that he is, is allowing this illness to remain for our salvation. And so the Bible gives us comfort when we lose loved ones. And she talks about this in early writings, how that when she got to heaven, she saw two pastors whom God laid in the grave to save them, is the way she put it. Uh, so when we're praying for lost people, and I, showed, I illustrated with, with Jim and with Mark what happens. When you're praying for lost people, uh, and you should read Daniel 10, Daniel 10 illustrates this beautifully because you've got evil spirits that are trying to force their way in on someone's life. But when you pray, the angels and Jesus come and do battle against those evil spirits. And so the more you pray, as I mentioned earlier, the more you pray, the more of the influence of God is brought to these people. So there were three boys, uh, and I'm going to finish with this story. There were three boys, Tony, Doug, and Larry. They all were about the same age. They all grew up in the same area. They were all from the Adventist families, all went to academy together. They did everything together. They were just three great friends, and everybody who knew them called them the three musketeers. They, when they did good, they did good together. And when they did bad, they did bad together. They were always together. And so they, they just really supported each other and did a lot of stuff together. They were just good friends. So they all left the church together. And they all went out and lived their life, maintained their connection with one another in that community. But they all turned their back on the church and went away from God and from the church. So this particular church, they decided that they were going to get serious about prayer. Look out. They got serious about prayer. And they said, we're going to really develop prayer ministry in our church. And they prayed all the time for two things. That God would bring former people, former Adventist people back to the church. And that God would bring new people into the truth to accept Jesus as their Savior. So they were praying for those two things. And they set aside 40 days for prayer and fasting. And they had a prayer group meeting somewhere every single day of the week for 40 days. Praying, praying and fasting. That God would bring former members back and that he would bring new people 
into the church. And so as this is going on, they decided they wanted to have a week of prayer. So at the end of that 40 days, I had the privilege of going to that church to do a week of prayer for that entire week. And we had a meeting every single night. And every single night, we had an altar call. And every single night, there were amazing miracles that took place because that church got serious about prayer. The very first night, Tony's grandma talked him into coming to the meeting. He didn't want to, but he loved his grandma. And because she was so good to him and because he didn't want to disappoint her, he came to the meeting. So Tony's sitting in the meeting, kind of against his will, being there for grandma. And as he's listening to the, the Bible, and we're going through the, the study that night, Tony's heart was being stirred, and the Holy Spirit was working. And when I made the call for anyone who wanted to receive Jesus as their Savior, Tony was the first one. He was a tall fella, stood up, came walking down the aisle of the church, much to the happiness and the audible uh, oohs and ahs of the people who saw Tony get up because a lot of them had been specifically praying for him and for Larry and for Doug. And to so here's Tony. He gets up and he comes forward to receive Christ as his Savior. Amen? Amen? So Tony accepts Jesus as his Savior. He was sincere about it. And the Lord came into his life, and a miracle took place. He was in church on Sabbath and happy to be there. He was in the meeting Saturday night. He was in the meeting Sunday night. And on Monday, he went back to his job at Hewlett Packard, where they were uh, producing printer cartridges. And he worked with a Buddhist lady in his little cubicle area. And uh, as they were working there that day, this young lady looked at Tony halfway through the day, Tony told me. And he said, Tony, what's going on with you? And he said, what do you mean? He, she said, something's different about you today. What's going on? And he said, he said, well, I don't really know what you mean. She says, well, you seem really happy. She said, did you meet a girl? <laughs> That's what she said. And he said, no, I didn't meet a girl. He said, uh, he said, I know you're a Buddhist. And he said, I don't know if you can understand what I'm about to say. He said, but Friday night, I went to my church and I accepted Jesus as my Savior, and Jesus is in my heart. And, and he said, if you notice something different about me, it's because Jesus is in me. He said, do you understand that? She said, no, I have no idea what you're talking about. And he, he, said, he said, well, why don't you come with me to the meeting tonight? Monday night. Why don't you come with me to the meeting tonight? She said, okay. So he picked her up, and she came with him to the meeting that night. And I'm just repeating to you what they told me. I don't understand all these things either but I, I know that God is working. So she walks into the church, and she takes about three steps into the church, Tony said. She's about six or eight feet inside the, in the foyer, and he said she just stopped still as a statue, put her arms out like this, had this look of awe on her face, and said, Tony, what is that? And he said, what do you mean? He was trying to see if she was looking at something, but no, she was just kind of staring off, and she was saying, what is that, Tony? And he said, what do you mean, what is that? She said, I feel something. She said, I feel something I've never felt before in my life. What is that? And he said, Ex describe it. She says, I don't know how to describe it. She says, it feels good. She said, uh, maybe loving. She said, I've never felt like that before. And Tony said, in kind of an awe tone of voice, he said, that's Jesus. That's Jesus. And she looked at him, and she said, really? He said, yes. He said, this church is a praying church, and the presence of Jesus is in this place. And she said, I like that very much. And they went in, and they sat down, and they sat in the back pew, back over there. There were four sections in that church, and they sat over here in this section in the back. I'll never forget, Tony was just happy. He had a big smile on his face, and I noticed he was sitting with this girl. That evening when I made the call for anyone to accept Jesus as their Savior, she was the first one out of her seat. She came walking down the, the, the aisle. She accepted Jesus as her Savior and was consequently baptized later. She accepted the Lord, a Buddhist lady, in a Seventh-day Adventist meeting, came up, came forward, received Christ as her Savior, and was baptized because that was a praying church. So then Tony, you know, he starts talking to Larry. Larry, you got to come to these meetings. I don't want to, Tony. you got to come to these meetings, Larry. I don't want to go. And this is going on and on. He says, Tony, if you want to do that crazy stuff, you go ahead, but I don't want to have anything to do with it. So on Wednesday night, Larry goes to his home. He had his own apartment, but he had to go to his mom and dad's home to get something. He knocks on the door. His dad comes to the door, 
He says, Dad, I need Mom. Where is she? She's got something that I need to get. He says, well, Larry, she's down at the meeting at the church. And, and Larry said, oh, yeah, 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 she told me about that. Tony told me about that, too. He says, uh, he says, well, I guess I'll go down to the church. So he goes driving down to the church, and he gets down there to the church about the time that the meeting is coming to a conclusion. And we had our, we, I just made an altar call when he walked in the door. He walks in the door of the church, and the church, like a lot of churches, and like these doors, they have windows in them. And so he looks through the window to see if he can see mom and grandma, and he sees them down at the front, and it looks like they're talking. So he just opens the door and comes walking in, comes walking all the way down, and gets right down here and stands right behind mom and grandma who are standing here. Well, what he didn't know was that they had responded to the altar call that night. <laughs> and, they had brought, and they had brought forward a lady with them who wanted to accept Jesus as her Savior. And so Larry comes, and, and he's, you know, even though he doesn't want to be involved in the church, he's not a disrespectful kid. So when he gets right down there to the front, he realizes everybody's praying. And so he just, you know, he just stands there quietly and, and doesn't interrupt. He's waiting for people to quit praying. And so I, I finished the, the prayer time and I had my prayer. And then I said, amen. And I looked up and I just happened to kind of look this direction. And I saw this whole thing transpire. Larry's mom and Larry's grandma, all of a sudden they notice that Larry's there. And they think he's come forward in the altar call. <laughs> so they scream almost in glee. They throw their arms around him. He becomes the filling of a sandwich, you know, you know, and there he's just being hugged, you know. Larry, I heard them say, everybody heard, Larry, you came to the church and you accepted Jesus as your Savior. Praise the Lord, you know. They're throwing their hands in the air and crying and hugging Larry and doing it all all over again. And at that point, Larry looks at me and he has this deer in the headlights look. <laughs> what just happened to me? You know? And they're just hugging him and crying and hugging him. And he's, as he's walking, I can see this look of like utter dismay as he's walking with his mom and grandma out of the church, you know? And then later, here's what Larry told me. He said, Pastor, he said, truth be told, he said, for a long time, I have known that I needed to give my life to Jesus. But for whatever reason, I just, just didn't do it. And he said, but when I saw how much my mom and grandma loved me, and when I saw the joy on their face and the tears in their eyes, he said, well, there's no better time than this. <laughs> and so between, so between the altar and the door, he gave his life to Jesus. <laughs> Because, it's a, because that was a praying church. And amazing things happen when the church prays. So then not long after that, and Doug, he was the hardest nut to crack because, boy, he had been abused and hurt. And it was just, oh, he, boy, just the idea of even going to the church at all just filled him with all kinds of awful feelings. And he just couldn't get, he just couldn't cross that, at least not that week. Not long after that, I had the pleasure of doing a week of prayer at Milo Academy in Oregon. And uh, I called up Tony and Larry because I, I said, you know, I need some younger people to help me to cross the bridge with these kids. I said, is there any chance that you guys could take a day or two and come and share your testimony and, and minister to the kids and just be available to talk to them and tell them about what God has done for you? And Tony said, absolutely. He says, I want to do that. Let me check. So he did some checking. He called me back and he said, Pastor, he said, I'm going to take the whole week off. And he said, I'm going to come help you at the academy. I said, oh, man, I would love that. And so he said, and Larry's going to do it too. I told Larry, Larry's coming too. I said, that's great. And he said, can we bring a friend? And I had never met Doug. He said, can we bring a friend? Now, I called and asked Tony to come and help me pastor these kids. And he said, Larry would come and help minister too. So when he said, can we bring a friend? I'm thinking they're bringing somebody that's going to help me work with the kids. Does that make sense to you? You know? All right. So, so Doug was that guy. And they talked Doug into coming with them to the academy for the whole week. All three of these guys took a whole week off to come and be there at that school to help me with these kids. So Doug, he's not converted. He comes in. He sits in the front row up here with Larry and Tony. And Friday night, that first Friday night, I'm kind of beginning the, the meeting and I'm telling, kind of laying out the format and what we're going to do each night. And 
I told them we were going to have a testimony each night and different things like that. And so we got through that preliminary stuff, and we had prayer. And then I looked right at Doug, and I said, Doug, I said, I've heard Larry's testimony, I've heard Tony's testimony, but I've never heard your testimony. <laughs> and Doug gave me the same look that Larry, <laughs> that Larry gave me. And, uh, and it was just a look of shock. And I thought, he's got stage fright, you know. <laughs> I thought that's what it was. But, but he was like, what am I going to do now? <laughs> but he got up. And he started walking up to the pulpit, and he told me later that between the pew and the pulpit, he gave his life to Jesus. <laughs> and that's why I call this story Converted by Mistake. <laughs> Let's stand together. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways and pray. Then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Dear Father, cause us to leave this place filled with the desire to be people of prayer, to be close to you, to be obedient. Some of us are probably going home to change a few things. Give us the courage. Show us how to do it. Show us how to throw out stuff we need to throw out and show us how to bring in stuff we need to bring in. Amen. And we ask you, Lord, to help us to be thorough and to make a clean sweep of anything that would in any way uh, be a roadblock between you and us. I pray that as we go from this place, it will be with faith and that we will be determined to be a people of faith that we will believe in your goodness, that we will believe in your plan, and that we will trust you even when we can't see the next step, knowing your heart, because we know your heart is good and that you have a good plan. So, Lord, help us to trust your heart when we don't know your plan. And we pray, Father, that you will please cause us to persist in prayer and to become better at prayer, and that our whole culture in our home will become a spiritual culture, that the culture in our church will become a spiritual culture. Lord, so please guide us that we will become this people of prayer. If my people pray. And then we know that you will do great miracles as you have done in the past. Please, Jesus, hear our prayer. In your precious name we